Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure and a privilege to have been invited to speak at this prestigious event held on the stage of the award-winning production here of Chicago. It's also timely as it marks the launch of a formal partnership between Edith Cowan University, the home of the Western Australian Academy of Performing Arts, and my own institution, the Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester, UK. The Vice-Chancellor and I are very excited indeed about the potential this important relationship brings to enhance the experience and future employability of our students. With the global challenges we are facing today, we believe it is essential for our institutions to speak with united voice from a truly international perspective. I'm confident that our partnership will make a difference, helping to ensure that our voice is heard. My oration today follows a tripartite structure. I open by setting the context, considering the impact of the performing arts profession and why performing arts education and training matters. I will focus on five specific areas of impact, political in its broadest sense, economic, social, educational, and the impact on the individual participant. I continue in part two by reviewing where we are today from two perspectives, the performing arts as a profession and the performing arts in higher education. I then invite you to indulge me in some scenario planning whilst I muse on what the future may hold. I propose some ways in which we might respond to the challenges ahead and consider why international partnerships will become ever more important. To conclude, I sum up and ask the question, what next? I've drawn on a wide range of sources to illustrate my oration today. Recent reports from influential bodies such as Arts Council England, the Creative Industries Federation, the Cultural Learning Alliance, the UK government, and recent research papers from music psychology and music pedagogy. To complement my speech, I'll be showing some short video clips from my colleague Darren Henley, the Chief Executive Officer of Arts Council England, who's recorded two clips especially for this occasion a very special young disabled performing artist. And last but not least, some videos showing our talented students who will tell us in their own words what a world-class education and training in the performing arts means to them and how it is shaping their future aspirations. So, to begin, what impact do the performing arts make above and beyond art for art's sake or entertainment? From a political perspective, the performing arts are intrinsic to our national heritage and cultural identity. In the classical musical world, this is exemplified by the many composers whose work is defined by their country of birth. One thinks of Sibelius's work, Finlandia, the national anthem of Finland, Smetana's Ma Vlast, My Homeland, Liszt's Hungarian dances, Malcolm Arnold's English dances, and so many more. Our national heritage and identity, in turn, is the foundation of our folk music, our world music, our popular music, and our country music traditions, as well as the inspiration behind so much of our art, literature, theatre, and dance. Sir Nicholas Sirota, former director of Tate London, encapsulates this in stating, through culture, we encounter the values and imaginations of others, past and present. Creativity is therefore one of the essential ingredients of personal and national identity. Our culture is also a constant in times of political uncertainty, and this is perhaps especially pertinent at the moment as we face what feels like an unprecedented period of change. Extremism, radicalization, new forms of terrorist threat, continuing conflict in different parts of the world, the rise of the far right across Europe, political uncertainty and an imminent Brexit in the UK, the controversial election of Donald Trump in the US, and so on. In such a challenging and uncertain political climate, it can be argued that the performing arts play an important role by enabling us to cross boundaries with a common language, helping to develop citizens with a global conscience, and most importantly, promoting the principles of an inclusive, democratic, and tolerant society. 
The performing arts can also be a powerful vehicle to raise awareness of political issues by setting these in new context. Examples drawn from classical music might be Tippett's A Child of Our Time, with its underlying themes of oppression, pacifism, and reconciliation. Shostakovich's Fifth Symphony, subtitled A Soviet Artist's Creative Response to Justified Criticism, and John Adams' The Death of Klinghoffer, recording the murder of a Jewish-American passenger by the PLO during the hijacking of the passenger liner Achille Loro. And from music theatre, one thinks of pieces such as Cabaret, with its dark and sinister Nazi undertones. More radically, we sometimes see music used as a more overt vehicle for political commentary. For example, Cornelius Cardew's self-explanatory Smash the Social Contract, Dame Ethel Smythe's Suffragette Anthem, March of the Women, and Steve Reich's Different Trains, a collage of music and recorded text commenting on politics and society pre, during, and post World War II. This approach is echoed by popular music artists too, Marcus Collins referring to the Beatles in his paper, The Beatles' Politics, as incredibly effective political activists. One only needs to think of the lyrics of John Lennon's Imagine, Working Class Hero and Revolution, or George Harrison's Taxman to see this force at work. Others, from Bob Dylan's 1963 Blowing in the Wind to Beyonce's 2016 anthem Freedom, have used their songs as forthright statements for African-American civil rights. Music can also be a powerful means to encourage us to reflect on the wider influx of conflict between peoples, commemorating victory through works such as Tchaikovsky's famous 1812 Overture, Shostakovich's Leningrad Symphony, and Berlioz's monumental Symphony Triomphante et Funerale. It can also help us to reflect on loss, for example, Britain's War Requiem, juxtaposing Latin texts with settings by the war poet Wilfred Owen, Messian's extraordinary moving Quartet for the End of Time, and Penderecki's Threnody for the Victims of Hiroshima. We are all familiar with the role of music in raising morale and community spirit, from our national anthems and patriotic songs through to our military music tradition, mass singing and chanting at sporting events, music at party political rallies, etc. Historically, music has also been a powerful source of comfort in times of adversity. One thinks of the profoundly moving performance of Samuel Barber's Adagio for Strings in commemoration of 9 11 and the impact artists such as Dame Vera Lynn had on raising morale amongst the troops in World War II. More recently, in my home city of Manchester, we have experienced at first hand the way in which music can play a central part in marking tragic events and helping diverse communities come together to reflect and find a positive way forward. Perhaps most poignant among the many concerts that were held was the return of the young American singer Ariana Grande only two weeks after the Manchester attack to perform again in the city, showing her blatant defiance in the face of such, atro such atrocities. To quote Victor Hugo, music expresses that which cannot be said, about which it is impossible to remain silent. From an economic perspective, there is compelling evidence that the creative industries, the broader category within which the performing arts resides, is a major contributor to gross domestic profit that fuels economic growth. I have a slide which will give you uh, some key statistics here, uh, which I hope you can all see, um, showing that the wider creative industries is the fastest growing sector of the UK economy, and that's since 2010. It delivers 87.4 billion in GVA, outstripping sectors we would not expect it to outstrip, automotive sector, life sciences, oil and gas, and aerospace, constituting 9% of the total exports in the UK, and probably most astonishingly, creating 2.9 million jobs, which has increased much more than other parts of, of the, of the econo economy in the UK. The impact of a performing arts education and training in promoting creativity and innovation across the wider workforce is now widely recognised, with a renewed focus on how this is essential to equip us to identify solutions to global challenges and future-proof our workforce. 
To quote Mark Carney, Governor of the Bank of England, there is an opportunity for mass employment through mass creativity. In my first video clip from Darren Henley, the Chief Executive Officer of Arts Council England, Darren makes a very compelling and concise case for economic impact. In the United Kingdom, our performing artists are part of our creative industries, and that's one of the fastest growing industries in the UK. We're very, very proud of that. It's a big export market for us, but it also makes life better here at home. To have people who are trained to the highest level in arts and cultural activities are absolutely crucial for any 21st century economy going forward. So I think that's a very nice summary of, of, of the points I was making. In spite of the obvious political and economic benefits, it could perhaps be argued that the most powerful impact of the performing arts is the ability to transform lives. The role of performing arts on health and well-being is now becoming widely appreciated. Pertinent examples would be improvement in recovery rates for hospital patients, a reduction in reliance on conventional medication, particularly anaesthesia, singing improving respiratory health, Dal Crows reducing the risk of falls among elderly people by an astonishing 50%. And music being played during brain surgery, both in the background and by the patient, to target specific parts of the brain. And there are many, many more of these telling examples. The National Institute for Health and Care Excellence in the UK issued guidelines to clinicians in 2016 recommending that they consider music therapy for people with all types and severities of dementia and all children and young people with psychosis or schizophrenia. In relation to community cohesion, participating in group performing arts activities such as choral singing brass bands, street dance, and targeted social interventions such as the El Sistema program, the project that began, began life in the favelas of Venezuela. These activities can establish a shared purpose and sense of direction. They can mitigate against crime and reoffending, and they can lead, as we've seen in Venezuela, to major societal change. The UK Department for Culture, Media and, Support, and, and Sport supports this concept. Noting, cultural participation can contribute to social relationships, community cohesion, and or make communities feel safer and stronger. Research has found positive links between cultural participation and improved social skills, and evidence that culture can play a role in tackling crime. Group participation also builds a sense of social responsibility, peer influence, engaging people with societal issues. One striking statistic is that 20% more people from low-income backgrounds who are actively involved in the performing arts are likely to vote. Rather than being seen as a luxury, the performing arts are now viewed as essential in any developed society. In countries where the focus has hitherto been primarily on economic growth, for example, China, Singapore, Hong Kong, the UAE, we are now seeing significant investment in culture and an understanding that this matters. This is reflected in infrastructure, cultural zones with incredible new venues, aimed at serving a population with disposable income, leisure time, and a growing thirst for the arts. Sir Richard Lees, the leader of Manchester City Council, emphasizes the impact of culture on establishing a sense of place. He says, ensuring a city has a cultural offer that makes it a place where people and businesses want to live, work and invest is not just desirable, it is essential. In relation to the educational impact of the performing arts, Darren Henley makes some very persuasive comments.
When preparing this oration, I stumbled upon what I think is a very simple but equally persuasive statement from former First Lady Michelle Obama, who served on the President's Committee on the Arts and the Humanities 2009 to 2016. She states, Arts education is not a luxury, it's a necessity. It's really the air many of these kids breathe. It's how we get kids excited about getting up and going to school in the morning. It's how we get them to take ownership of their future. There is now compelling evidence that education in the performing arts raises aspiration and provides a sense of purpose and direction. It increases overall cognitive ability by 17%. And it enhances attainment in all other subjects. It also improves behavior and mitigates against crime 18% of offenders who are involved are less likely to re-offend. And it supports progression from low income and non-higher education backgrounds. Those who study the performing arts are three times more likely than others to get a degree. It develops the transferable skills that enhance employment, independence, teamwork, communication, presentation, confidence, numeracy, literacy, literacy creativity, the list goes on and it establishes an ethos of lifelong learning. In her influential paper, The Power of Music, Professor Susan Hallam notes, high quality musical activities seem to affect aspirations, which enhance motivation and subsequently attainment. At this point, I would like to pause and invite singer Chelsea Burns, who studied here at WAPA and is now at the RNCM with us, to the platform to tell, her, tell us in her own words what difference a high-quality performing arts education is having to her life. Chelsea. Thank you, Linda. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As Linda previously mentioned, my name is Chelsea Burns and I studied here at WAPA from 2012 until 2015. During my time here, I completed my Bachelor of Music as well as my graduate diploma in the Classical Voice Department. I'm currently studying my Masters of Music at the RNCM. Unlike a lot of my friends in this industry, I came into the world of music at a relatively late stage. I had always sung to a certain degree, but I thought my path was going to be in the world of sport until injury made that impossible. Finding myself a bit lost at the age of 15, I had someone suggest to me that I should begin thinking about a career in music. I first began in musical theatre and then discovered the world of classical music at 17, and I have not looked back since. The advantage of me finding this path so late has been that most of my mentors have been of an extremely high standard. The teachers I have, have, I have encountered during my time both here at WAPA and at the RNCM have been of a very high calibre and have always challenged me to be better. I firmly believe that their mentorship has guided me to discover more about not only who I am as an individual and as an artist, but many facets of who I am as a person as well. This career path has ignited a passion in me that I don't know if I would have found otherwise through another vocation. There are no real black and white answers, so you are instead pushed to think for yourself, something that I have found is not always encouraged in other professions. I also think it's important to note that music pushes you to develop not only on an intellectual level, but also on a spiritual, emotional and physical level too. It's for all these reasons that I think it's incredibly important for every person to be exposed to musical learning on some level. Whether that be just as a hobby, as a profession, or anything in between, the way that it encourages you to develop is very positive. The skills you pick up through this art form are, tra are transferable to every part of life, and it allows people to explore parts of life that society may not have allowed them to otherwise. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. I think that's a very nice summary of the, of the difference this type of education and training can make to the individuals involved. There is a growing body of evidence that suggests if you engage as a practitioner in the performing arts, it will enhance quality of life, increase confidence and sense of self-worth, and also improve general health. It can also be life-changing. The video clip I'm about to show you features one of our postgraduate cello students, Abel Salacho, who comes from South Africa and is a major now award-winning international player. Abel will explain in his own words that the difference of performing arts education and training has made to his life.
As we live in an ever more stressful environment, the performing arts have an important role to play in providing a sense of release, helping us to transcend those day-to-day -day concerns, offering us a means of escapism and increasing social interaction. More profoundly, engaging in the performing arts can be a powerful means to overcome severe personal adversity. For example, mental illness, the pianist David Helfgott, John Ogden, associated with our respective institutions, and more recently, the young pianist James Rhodes. Hearing or sight loss, the deaf percussionist Evelyn Glenny, and the blind tenor Andrea Bocelli, and major physical disability. To illustrate the latter, I have a short video clip featuring a young German horn player who has been supported by the One-Handed Instrument Trust, a charity we at the RNCM are very proud to be associated with, which provides adapted instruments and enabling devices for musicians with severe special needs. I think you will see that this video speaks for itself. So I think you can see we're very excited to partner with that trust to have some scholarships to enable students like Felix to come and study with us at the RNCM. It's incredibly moving to see such a high calibre player um, with, uh, in such difficult circumstances. So to review where we are now in the wider context, we're living in an increasingly virtual world where the way we create, capture and disseminate the performing arts is changing. This is exemplified through the rapid rise of social media, the advent of 5G, our whole lives run from a mobile device. We're seeing major changes in how young people access music. More children in the UK are learning electric guitar than violin. The ukulele has replaced the recorder as a first instrument and sophisticated MIDI systems make composition and arranging accessible to all. There has been an exponential growth in TV talent shows where young people are catapulted into the limelight, easily influenced by the desire to become famous overnight, but so inherently vulnerable to exploitation. We are also facing an urgent imperative to reconcile the conflict between artistic integrity and the economic realities of today's world. We're seeing the rise of the superstar phenomenon, the demands of society to democratize our culture, democratize our culture and the explicit way some performers are marketed and exploited on the basis of sexual attraction rather than artistic ability. In the UK, the listening audience that tunes into classical music to hear accessible classical music in bite-sized chunks now far exceeds those who are prepared to devote the time and concentration to listen to serious art, music's played, art music works played in full. In our haste to develop new audiences, we need to ask whether we are being tokenistic or dumbing down when we juxtapose classical and popular genres, resort to targeted interventions specifically to develop audiences, and migrate into ever more extreme alternative venues. 
The changing demographic of society clearly presents us with both a challenge and an opportunity, with a pressing need to provide for a growing elderly population. Looking at where we are now in the performing arts higher education sector, there are far fewer specialist independent conservatoires or monotechnics, with the norm being performing arts faculties located within large universities. In the UK, we are also seeing the emergence of many private providers who are by necessity much more commercial in outlook. Unfortunately in our sector, we are still too often perceived as being elite and inaccessible. And while there is a constant pressure to reduce costs, there is an equally strong pressure to still achieve world-class outcomes. As new technologies take hold, I think it would be fair to say that our digital strategies are still at an embryonic stage. And we are still unable to articulate what research and scholarship really means in a practice-based context or to know how best to promulgate its outcomes. As we reflect on what the future may hold, what might we assume? I would predict that the future will be increasingly global, the future will be increasingly virtual, and the future will be increasingly media-driven. The notion of a full-time contracted employment and the concept of a job for life will continue to diminish. The performing arts will continue to move out of conventional settings to meet the community on its own terms. Pre-tertiary provision will remain under threat, reducing our pipeline of future students. Demographic shifts will lead to an increased demand from third age learners. We will need to embrace new technologies in ways we cannot yet envisage. And as public funding reduces, we will be ever more reliant on fundraising and philanthropy to continue our work. So how might we respond to these challenges? I would argue firstly that quality must be upheld at all costs. I believe our curriculum will need to promote and reward breadth, flexibility and individuality, supporting each individual student's aspirations and allowing them to lead and take risks. Entrepreneurship will become ever more important. We will need to answer the question about what this really means in our context, how we teach it, if indeed we do, and its intrinsic value. We'll need to invest in facilities and resources that are future-proofed, which is an enormous challenge with technology moving so, so fast. Students will need the high-level digital skills with which to create, capture, and disseminate their work to an increasingly virtual audience. And they will also need the imagination to adapt and constantly reinvent themselves as artists. Success for our students will depend on them having the ability to work effectively across the wider community while international connections, cultural understanding and language skills will be essential for future employment in a global world. We will need to reach out to support the pre-tertiary sector in a meaningful way to sustain our pipeline of future students. We will need to demonstrate the relevance and impact of our scholarship and research. And we will need to offer our staff a disproportionate number who, of whom are part-time appropriate and accessible professional development opportunities and accreditation as teachers in higher education. And last but not least, we will of course need to secure our future sustainability. A world-class education and training in the performing arts is costly and we are facing an ever-increasing reliance on external funding to survive. So in this context, why will international partnerships matter more than ever before? We're preparing our students for careers on the international stage in a fast-moving and increasingly competitive market. To be successful, our graduates will need an international perspective, cultural awareness and extensive transnational contacts and networks. If we're to lobby effectively for our sector, we will need to bring a truly global perspective. And if we are to remain world class, it will be essential for us to share best practice in pedagogy, scholarship and research with our international peers. The impact of institutional partnership is demonstrated in the following clip from Daniela Sakari, who came to the RNCM from WAPA to continue her vocal studies.
whether the end of that clip will encourage any male singers to come over to the UK, I'm not really quite sure. But, um, but that was a live performance that, that Danny was giving, so, um, and we were very grateful to her to let, let us film it. So. so to conclude, what next? From a historic context, the performing arts have survived and flourished over time in spite of the challenges. They have provided a constant in a challenging and rapidly changing world. And they are also part of what we are as human beings and what differentiates us from other species. Whilst the political, economic and social cultural impact is becoming more widely appreciated, there is much more we need to do to raise awareness of the value of the performing arts and evidence the return on investment. There is an important role for those of us working in higher education to lead this research agenda. I believe we must work together to overcome those historic preconceptions of elitism and privilege. And this will involve us facing up to the challenges of diversity and inclusivity, including black and minority ethnic engagement, in a transparent and open way, and with a sector-wide call to action. We must also find a way to resolve the dichotomy between artistic integrity and the economic realities of today's profession. There is a delicate balance to be struck here, as if we are unable to develop new audiences, our very future will be in question. In a fast-changing world, it is also ever more important we ensure our voice is heard. To quote my colleague John McGrath, Artistic Director of the Manchester International Festival, artists help us to see new possibilities, and we need them now more than ever. From a positive perspective, although the financial rewards might be less than in other professions, there is a growing quest among young people for a career path that is genuinely fulfilling and in society for a better quality of life enriched by culture. Recruitment remains strong at the top institutions, albeit in an increasingly challenging and competitive market where students are better for informed and ever more discerning customers. The economic case to invest in the performing arts and performing arts education is a compelling one. My colleague John Kampfner, Chief Executive Officer of the Creative Industries Federation, summarises, our great art galleries, our flourishing TV industry, our growing reputation for fashion and all the many other achievements are imperiled if we do not invest in the arts and cultural education. They are part of one ecosystem, one success story. In closing, the focus of my oration today has been to promote the value of a world-class education and training in the performing arts. I will leave the final words to one of the outstanding vocal students who progressed to the RNCM from WAPA, soprano Samantha Clark.
Thank you. I think if you needed any evidence about the value of a performing arts education and training and the value of institutional partnership, those clips and the ones that I'm very proud of are the students who studied here at WAPA and then came over to us at the RNCM is all the proof and the evidence you will need. Thank you for listening.